we'll, we'll be with the book of James. Let's try to work through chapter one. But um, one of the things I was thinking about, I don't know if you guys fall into this, but when you're sitting at church sometimes and you hear something and then you go, oh man, that totally applies to so-and-so. I should tell them about this. <laughs> You're probably immediately going to start reading and go, I can think of all the people that need to hear this book. God's message for you is, you need to hear this book. Don't think about anyone else. Think about you and be challenged by this. If it's something you do already, awesome. That's spectacular. If it's not, James is the book of practical Christian living. And that's really it. I mean, to me, it's the most practical book. And it's one of the hardest books to really get through because generally by verse 2 or 3, you're like, I can't do this stuff. So, let's, uh, let's just start reading. Verse 1, chapter 1 of James. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Let's just let's stop right there. First of all, who's James? If you guys aren't familiar, James is the half-brother of Jesus. Um, Jude, if you were here... It was a Thursday night, uh, just before we started in uh, September, we did the Book of Jude. I didn't line that up, it just so happened. But Jude and James both were not believers in the Lord while he was here. And there's stories in Scripture where his family comes to get him because they think he's nuts and trying to get him out of, you know, spreading his craziness. Those were his brothers. And the Lord even says, like, who are my brothers and brothers and fathers? It doesn't, those things don't matter. You're all my family. Um, but James was known for the fact that he really disagreed with Jesus and his teachings. But, in 1 Corinthians, James had a direct experience with the Lord after his resurrection, and it changed his life forever. So much so that he became known as the man of prayer. There's stories that say that his knees were so callous from going to prayer that it, they looked like a camel's knee. They were all just messed up because he, he spent so much time in prayer to the Lord. He doesn't, much like Jude here, he doesn't take advantage of the fact that he is the half-brother of Jesus. I would. I mean, if I was the brother of Jesus, I'd be like, look, Jesus is my brother, so bow down and do what I say. And he goes, no, he's, I'm, I'm a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He recognizes who he is and by his title. So what's a bond servant? If anybody's familiar with that particular phrase, I mean, it's, it's a bit different than a <coughs> regular servant. So I, I think it's good that we think about why he calls himself that. Jude, uh, Paul does it. Servitude is a foregone conclusion in Christian life. right? Serving others, serving your family, serving your spouse, serving your kids, serving your church, serving your job. <laughs> it's all of those things, right? And service is to give of yourself to that as an offering. And really, if we do it correctly, we do it without anything in return, or the expectation of anything in return. In Scripture, it's often referred to as being a slave, which is not a popular word nowadays, but the fact is, is slave and servant, those really are, those really, that's the, that's the actual word God used. Now, in the Old Testament, right, in, in Jewish law, there were rules around being a servant. You, you, you weren't to beat your, your, your servant, you weren't to treat them you know, terribly. You're supposed to do things for them, um, but likely, the word indentured servant comes along, you likely were a servant because you owed someone something, and that's how you paid your time back. Um, you know, I, I, heard, I could hear a mom or a wife saying, I'm not your indentured servant, you know, which is, I don't owe you anything, I'm doing this because I love you, stop taking advantage of the fact that I served you. But a bond servant's a little different. Based on Jewish law, you would have a set time that you would serve someone. If the year of Jubilee came along in the middle of that, you'd be freed from all of those things. But that came along every 50 years, so hopefully you're not a slave for 50 years. James uses this term because bond servant becomes something a little different. If you aren't familiar with it, the bond servant is a person who was a servant, or slave, I'll use those words interchangeably, um, it was someone who had finished their service and were so impressed or so loved or cared for by the person they served that they decided out of their own free will to stay with them. These people were marked a bit differently. They, you would know a bond servant because generally they would travel with their master and um, if they 
said, hey, look, we, we, I don't want to leave. I want to continue to serve you for the rest of my life. The master would go out. He would take an awl. Anybody, everybody familiar with what an awl looks like? Basically, a screwdriver that has a fine point on it. And they would drive it through the ear of the servant, and then they would place a gold ring inside of their ear. It was a mark of that person that they are a servant, but they have chosen that. And they have chosen it because the master is so good. So I told others, I do these things because I choose to. That's, that's what James is saying he is. So he went from a non-believer, half-brother, embarrassed by Jesus, to calling him Lord Jesus, and taking on the title bond servant. That that is what we should be, bond servants. That God has been so good, we choose to be marked by him, to remain in service of him. And I love it. Just I love the fact that he, he does not call out that he's his brother. And he says to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, he's speaking probably most likely to the Jews here, but the Christians that are scattered among the Jews, that are, are scattered all over from the twelve tribes of Israel. He says, greetings, my brethren, my brothers, my sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay, so I'm already out. This is the hardest verse in the entire chapter already. <laughs> count it all joy. So what's the difference between joy and happiness? See, PC people, right? Today's message to others is be happy. Do whatever it takes to be happy. I don't really use the word joy very often. Joy is actually a choice. Happy is a feeling. And like feelings are are, are a reality. We're going to go through stages in life where we feel certain things, but then they fade, which is why we aren't to be led by feelings. We can't live our life by them. But joy is different. Joy is a, a choosing of a remembrance of good things. It's not, you know, you can be going through the worst trial of all time and still find joy in it. But you might not be happy to it. And what does he say? He says, when you fall into them. This is not like a, like just stumbled across them. He, the Greek word here, uh, and I won't even pretend to pronounce it, but ultimately means plunging, like diving into trials, or falling so far into a trial that you can't see your way back out. So he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So what's James say here? He says that trials don't produce faith. They test the faith you have. Well, if, what's the point of a trial then? Right? It's, it's to show you in some ways the faith that you have or that you lack, where you should grow, ultimately to bring you to the Lord that you might grow. Well, then how is faith produced? Romans says faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. As we read the Word of God, this is why is the Calvary Chapel? We do it the way we do. We read it, we explain it, we chew on it, we read it, we explain it, we chew on it, we keep doing it. It doesn't matter what I say. And I can give you all the wisdom in the world, but it isn't really going to matter until you take this thing and apply it to your life. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. There is a supernatural process that happens when people read this word. Now, a non-believer who has no regard for God, or the things of God, they find it to be Greek. Literally Greek. Like, well, it was just characters and words and all these big words and these themes, and, and God's just jealous, and God stinks, and he doesn't help me in my life. Right? People that don't understand, they read these things, and they go, I don't, I don't even know what that says. People that have been filled with the Holy Spirit read it and go, oh man, how have I missed this all this time? And they get changed by it. So, Faith is produced by reading the Word, by applying the Word, and then trials come along to test our faith, to see what it is that we're made of. And it's God's way of growing us. So what's the fruit from a trial? Patience. Uh, what's the, I think I hear the saying a lot, people will say, like, oh, I don't, I don't pray for patience um, as a new believer, because when you pray for patience, God will teach you patience, and it's a painful process. I certainly don't have patience. I'm way too hot-headed, especially when I drive. And on Broadway. And coming out here, actually. It can be the worst in the morning when I'm trying to get here on time, and it's like, 
I don't know why this person's going 60, because it could be going 80 right now, and it would be perfectly fine, and if they just moved out of the way, I'd be good. And then there's that weird 25 spot in Kandusuke as well. You know, you're like, oh, now I'm in the Kandusuke spot. I've got to slow down. And I got a ticket there years ago. I'm pretty sure it was Kandusuke. So I'm, I'm a little careful. But, you know, going through a trial is supposed to produce patience. If that's what God's purpose is behind a trial, then what's the enemy's purpose behind a trial? Because if God's in it, the enemy's likely in it and doing something as well. His chore, job, goal, is to help us sin during a trial. right? To drag us away from what God is doing. If we can shorten the trial beyond what God asks, um, then we, we end up in sin. right? Because anything we do to shorten a trial is just cutting short what God wants, which is the definition of sin. If we, you know, are waiting on something or yearning for something that we're trying to resist, the devil wants us to give in to that. It will shorten the trial. So, trials are to grow patience and to test our faith. And likely, in a lot of trials, we fail. It's, it's how it works. It's okay. I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's okay to sin. I mean, the failure, God doesn't go, oh, that's it, I'm done with you. He goes, okay, let's, let's do this again, right? The more trials you find yourself in, the longer they are, there's a likelihood you're not spending enough time in this. And let me clarify that. I'm not saying if you don't read your Bible, God's going to send you trials purposefully. I'm saying you're probably not going to produce the fruit in the trial that you want because you haven't grown your faith to begin with. So, Trial comes along, God wants to produce patience in us and test our faith. He says in verse 4, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So this comes back to what I was just saying. Trials, we want something in them. We want it to be over. We want to get to the goal, whichever, whatever that is. We want to achieve whatever it is we're waiting on. Uh, we want the answer to the test results that we're waiting on. We don't want it to be cancer. We don't want it to be permanent. We want to move on from these things and have peace in our life, right? So that there's no trials. If we're looking at the scripture correctly, there's going to be plenty of trials. And it's just the way it's going to be because this is how God works. But he says that if we let patience have its perfect work, right? If we, we endure through these trials that God will do something in us. I mean, think about what... All right. One time, I went to my pastor and I said, oh man, I'm really struggling with this. Do you, do you even struggle with this? You know, I'm looking for him to say, like, yeah, look, it's, it's part of the Christian life. And he just goes, no. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. I guess I'm not leaving. And he goes, no, I don't. No, but he's like, but you didn't ask if I ever did. Yes, sure I did. As time has gone on, the trials become different. Sometimes they become harder or worse. You know, I mean, if, if I'm still battling tr with the trial of getting out of bed in the morning, maybe my maybe my faith isn't so great. Maybe I should invest more time into God's word and in servitude to God's people. Because service reminds you how much you you have left because you go to serve and you're like, that person didn't even say thank you. Wow. That's not what service is about. Service is about doing it without wanting anything in return. So he said, you know, no, Charlie, you know, that this is part of what God does. There are things that today you struggle with, you probably won't in 20 years. That's okay. Because that's that's growth. You know, there may be something you still battle with and God still wants to work on with you 20 years later. You know, addiction. That it's a it's a tough battle. And that's one that just doesn't end. There's always something. But as we do that, we become complete, it says, and lacking nothing. That's content. So if a trial comes along, it tests our faith, it produces patience so that we might grow. And then it says, in these times, you can be perfect, lacking nothing. If you, if you find yourself, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't think James is saying we're perfect, we've achieved some level of nirvana where we never sin and we don't struggle and we don't have strife. That's, that's just not part of this world. But what he's really getting at is if you find contentment in life and you're not always striving for something, the trials become a lot different. 
Because a lot of times, trials are stuff we want, right? We're waiting for something, we want to achieve something, we're waiting for the new job or whatever, whatever God has. If we were to sit in God, sit with God in peace, understanding that the trial came along to test my faith, that God is not doing it because he hates me, he's not making me wait because he's mad, he's not going, see, you didn't wait ten years ago for this, so now this is your punishment. God's not punitive. It's not how he looks at things. He wants us to change and grow and to ultimately not be striving for the things of the world here and now that we find contentment in him. He says in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed up by the wind. Well, we should stop reading James as I'm five or six verses in, and I'm applying it to me going, man, I don't even ask in faith. I ask going, Lord, can we just be done with this trial, and I know you're not going to end it, like a pessimist, right? Because that's what I do, right? It's, it's part of who I am. Well, it's part of who I've let myself become. Wisdom is a great thing. What's wisdom? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Wisdom is knowledge applied. Wisdom tells you what to do with all the knowledge you gain. What makes a person fresh out of college not the greatest worker in the world, even though they just put four years in the school? They have no wisdom. They have all this knowledge that they've amassed. They don't know what to do with it. I, you know, I'm a, I hire programmers, I'm a director of a company, and, you know, there are people come in and they're like, well, I just, I just finished my four-year degree in programming, and blah, 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 and I'm like, man, what do you do for fun in life? Oh, well, uh, I don't know, you know, how long have you been programming? You know, do you do it on the side? Do you, do you enjoy breaking things apart? You know, those are the questions I ask. I don't really care about <coughs> education, honestly. And it's not that I, it's not worth it. It just, it doesn't mean anything to the working world. The guy straight out of school coming in isn't going to know how to solve problems. He isn't going to know how to talk to customers. He isn't going to know how to think through something and go, okay, look, here's what we should do. And we're like, have you thought about this? No. Have you thought about that? No. Well, I just figure I'll just do this and then I'll fix things as they, you know, as they break. No, that's not how you, it's not how you do this. Wisdom is what all of the adults in our lives are trying to impart to us. We were just having this conversation in the car this morning about our dog, right? You know, she thinks she's the smartest thing in the world. She's got it all figured out. She lacks, entirely lacks wisdom. Doesn't think about how this stuff will work out in life and how to apply the things that she does know. But God, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Who was the wisest man in the Bible? Anyone know? Solomon. Solomon. Who said that? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, spectacular. Doctor. I remember his name. Solomon is the wisest man because that's what he asked of God. God said, I'll give you everything, anything you want, what do you want? And he says, wisdom. And we get the book of Proverbs out of Solomon, right? The wisest man. Now, he wasn't obviously the wisest of all people because he took on hundreds of wives and concubines and clearly never learned one is plenty. You don't need to just exacerbate that whole <coughs> relationship, experience. That's a good way to put it. I was thinking life problem. It's, it's a weird way to put that. You know, he, so he, he was a wise man, though. I mean, he was. And God wants to give us wisdom. He wants to teach us how to live through these things. This is what he gave the book of James for. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. And we can't doubt God once we start talking to him. Hey, God, can you just get me through this trial? But I know he won't, but anyway, I figured I'd ask. You know, okay, thanks. <laughs> Walk away, right? I mean, that's, that's what I do. It's like I... I'm like, I don't even know, God, I'm not even going to ask for help in this trial anymore, because you know I don't even believe you're going to help me. The fact is, he does. But multiple times in this subject about asking in faith, what is that? What are you asking? What's faith? The hope for things unseen. Faith is, I hope for this thing that will occur. But how do I know it will? Because I look at God's past faithfulness to me and all the things that he's done and brought me to this point. That why would he just now desert me and leave me? So when we ask in faith, we go, look, Lord, you've brought me through these trials before. I know you will bring me through it. If I'm asking for a million dollars in the trial, likely God's probably not giving me a million dollars. If I ask for wisdom to know what to do, 
how to approach someone, fill me with your spirit, that maybe in the midst of this trial, it's, um, it's for me to, to go speak to someone, right? To bring up something in their life that's destructive. You know, and those can be tough conversations. You could just go in and be like, don't be an idiot. But you're probably not going to win them. All right? But if you go in and maybe you explain some of what's happened in your life and you tell them a story about how God's been faithful to you, maybe you see that thing, go, man, you know what? I'm kind of in the middle of a trial too. And they're like, yeah, I know. That's what I was sharing. <laughs> well, there's subtle ways of, of being a part of somebody's life, right? But without doubting God. And that's, it's, it's a difficult thing. Uh, and, I, and I understand it. But what does he say? That here, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven, tossed by the wind. I mean, think back to the, the Lord and the disciples are floating in the boat, right? And the storm's raging, and he's in the back sleeping, and they're all running around. I imagine, as fishermen, they're these big dudes that they're running around screaming like girls. Well, okay, I shouldn't say it like that. It's not the way I was screaming like girls, but. Like little girls that saw a spider. Like, let's, let's go that, right? They're running around and they're screaming and they're like, I don't know what's going on. You gotta get me out of here. And they look over and he's sleeping. And they're like, What are you doing? How are you even sleeping? And he's like, Oh, you little faith. Man, I, well, you guys all doubt everything. And I'm, I'm riding in the boat with you. And he's like, Stop. And the storm just immediately stops. They go off and have other adventures and run into the same things. And they don't ever think back to that moment where they go, I wasn't drowning. I wasn't going to die. He's able to calm the storm. I'll cling to him. So we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Have you ever seen somebody in the middle of a trial who's t- t- doubting? <clears throat> like one day you talk to them and they, they sound strong. And the next day you talk to them and they're like crying and they're like, this is t- terrible. And the next day you talk to them and they're like, no, I, I got out of that. I'm good now. And then the next day you talk to them and they're crying again. And you're like, man, you're just all over the place. Don't want to be like that. And seven, for let not the man suppose that we will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double, double-minded man, unstable in all in all his ways. This is that going into a situation expecting God to give us something. Go in with the expectation of God giving you something. You know, go into the trial, find joy in the moment, knowing that God has called you into this trial. You have not just randomly fall into it. God is producing this. He wants something out of it, right? He's going to show you your faith needs to be grown. It's going to produce patience in you, and you're going to change. This is like your kids, right? Your kids are screaming, and you're like, man, this is so embarrassing. Please stop screaming. If you stop screaming right now, when we leave here, we will get ice cream. And they're like, well, what kind of ice cream? Like, okay, I can see you're clearly going to weigh out whether you want to continue screaming or not based on how good the gift is. We'll just go with it's going to be ice cream, right? And that's what he's saying. Don't do that. Don't find yourself trying to persuade God by giving you something if you are good for the trial. Because you're going to fail five minutes later. It's just, it's just how it works. I mean, maybe, maybe you guys figured it out. I have. In verse 9, it says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat that it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also will fade away in his pursuits. So is it a good thing to be rich in the kingdom? Not really. Because it says that the, the least will be first and the most will become last. Right? Just God saying you, people can't be rich? No. I don't believe that at all, right? God uses people of all lifestyles and all types. There are some some great Christians that give lots of money that are what we would call rich. But I think the average person, right, we're all middle class or less. Or I don't know what the world value that by now. But he says, let the lowly brother glory. And it's not just a, a man thing, right? This is a brother or sister. Let, to be lowly in attitude and spirit, to be meek is what he's getting at. That that those people would be exalted by God. Because God, one of the things God says he hates is pride. There's a couple of things he says he hates. Pride is one of those. Because pride doesn't leave any room for God to work. No room for God's uh, blessings in life. or No room to understand that what God has done for you. Pride is, is a nasty thing. But it's difficult because we live in a world that says be proud of who you are. Right? Be, be proud of what you've done. I'm, like, I'm not proud of what I've done. I'm in a mess up my life. I'm not proud of that. 
But it's done in a way to like, don't let any of the world tell you you're wrong. Well, God's going, no, you're totally wrong, actually. You're totally wrong. You're going to stand before me one day and I'll tell you all of the wrongs because he's got a whole big book all full of them. But the lowly person that approaches God, knowing who they are, knowing what they've done, knowing how good God is, God wants to exalt those people. And he's going to push down the crowd. And he says that, he's making a statement here that the rich in his humiliation, that, that rich people are harder to be lowly. Right? There are very few in comparison to rich people, right? And the, there are very few that are humble and lowly and use their the gifts that God has given them to do things. And then most of the time you wouldn't know them because they don't want you to know who they are. They give in secret, like God has asked. right? So that people don't go, oh, look at him, he's so rich and he gave all kinds of money. And we're talking about this, <laughs> they're on the radio. I don't know if you've heard, I mean, you guys have heard about the Maui destruction, right? The, the fires. It's always amazing to me, you know, They need money. They need help. All right? And uh, so Oprah and The Rock got together to build a foundation to pour all kinds of money in. The Rock is Samoan. Right? His family is Pacific Islander, you know, some of it. How much do you think they gave? Now, let me just qualify. I don't actually, I didn't, I should have looked it up real quick. I looked up Oprah's net worth because she made me gross me out more than The Rock. But Oprah's net worth is just shy of $3 billion. She and I were talking about this. She goes, that's probably not liquid assets. Very true. Probably not. However, a woman worth $3 billion who is for the oppressed people, because that's what she's been, right? The Rock, my guess is he's in the billions as well. He's one of the highest paid actors. How much do you think they, they combined together before they went to the people and asked? Just throw out some numbers, you might think. No. Two billion. Well, that's... It's sadly not shy. It's not far. I mean, $10 million. Two people, the richest people, some of the richest people in this nation, pulled together $10 million for Maui. And they were proud of that. And they took a beating in the media. People were like, who are these people? Oprah gives $10 million away on one of her shows. They're like, oh, by the way, there's $10 million under your seat. And someone screams, and they're, like, all excited. Oprah has property there, too. Yep, sure. she yeah. does. And, uh, by the way, she also has a private fire department who protected her property well. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing. Man, right? I mean, come on. You're supposed to be for the people? <clears throat> she left the people a long time ago. And to me, she left the black people a long time ago. It's hard. Rich people need more humiliation, is what he's saying. That's humiliation might change them. Because what are they? They're proud. They want to be seen as being something. But he says it as because as the flower of the field will pass away, for no sooner is the sun risen with the burning heat than the withers the grass, the flower fails, falls, and this beautiful appearance perishes. I mean, there's wisdom in applying this even to life, right? You're young, want to get married, you're a guy, look for the, you look for the most beautiful person in your class of person that you can find. It's, you know, it's when we're young and stupid, so we're like, okay, look, I, I'm not in that class of girl. I will not get that one. But in the next class, where can I rank, right? I mean, how can she look? Man, that's... I remember thinking those things. It was like, well, I wouldn't have her, but I could. That's probably more my class, so I'll shoot for that one, right? And then the girl that likes you is the girl that you're not attracted to, and she's like, oh, I, you know, would be the most loyal person and loving person for your entire life. But you're like, uh, she's, well, it's pretty. Well, marry that one, right? Like you go, go to your, go to your class reunion sometimes, see what people look like. I don't look anything like what I used to look like. And I don't mean I was good looking, I mean I, still, I just don't look anything like what I used to look like. It's how it works. The flower is the same way, right? It, it fades. It's, it's temporary beauty. And he says these things because he's trying to remind us that these things we measure by in the world, riches, homes, uh, having property, having 
cars, all those things will fade. What's going to happen to a car? What happens? Okay, you can afford a Lamborghini when you bring it to Maine and you decide to drive it on the road at all. What's going to happen? Eventually, it's going to rot. It's just it, inevitable. You live by the coast, it'll rot just because of the air. You can't keep these things. The houses will break down. Your body will break down. Beauty will fade. You know, at the end of the day, when you're ugly crying ladies, you know, you're like, oh, don't look at me, I'm not beautiful. Well, there's still beauty in that, right? Your heart, you're showing your heart. And to love people for who they are, not for what they look like. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. In verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man or woman who endures. Anybody run? Like physically run? Like as a skill? Is it, is it fun? Was it fun when you first started? Yeah. <laughs> Agony. I got, I got a chance to fill in, and we were in a similar passage in uh, 2 Corinthians. I got a chance to fill in for Pastor Ken. We were talking about that. And I know there's all kinds of runners in the church, and you know, like I've said, they've been running, but yeah. And I'm like, man, that is just ridiculous. <laughs> running is nuts. Now, I am sure there is benefit, right? There is. Paul says there's benefit to physical exercise. And, you, you, and you're like, well, that's no, not too terrible. Well, because you, you got through it. I mean, if I run right now, when I get to the hallway, I'm going to just lay down on the floor and be like, somebody give me some water and a soda. And I'm, I'm out of energy, maybe a ring ding, something, you know. <laughs> it's endurance. You've built up your endurance. And you have to, right? For anything, we have to build up endurance. Enduring is a painful word. It's painful in God's kingdom. It's painful in life. Enduring trials is difficult. How did you have kids? Like, how, how did you get through labor? Yeah. You had to endure. Right? And, but does it get, well, that's probably not a great question. Does it get easier after? I have no idea. And it's like, probably not. I mean, I imagine that you don't. Tattoos. You can build up your tolerance to that. You can um, build up your tolerance to, I don't know, kind of weak So it's hard. I'm like trying to think of things you can. I mean, endurance is. A reality of trials and a reality of being a Christian. The Christian life is an active life. Even patience isn't doing nothing. You have to work while you're being patient for God. So he says, but you're, you'd be blessed if you were to endure that temptation. You know, I'm sure there, if you tempted me with alcohol, it would not be my thing. You know, I, uh, drugs, alcohol was a problem for me somewhat, but drugs never, you know, never a thing. I got high twice in my life. And neither time was good, and I didn't enjoy it, and I was like, man, it is a waste of time. I, probably not the right drugs, and I wouldn't do them today. Alcohol, you know, you get around people, and your friends, and you do it, and you start drinking, and then you start to feel good. And then, for me, it's a, it's not even a slippery slope. It's like in an instant. Oh, that was one too many drinks, and it's all coming back out. And you know, eventually, if you're like me, you find yourself with a head in the toilet and then thirsty and dying for water. And you're like, well, I'll flush the toilet. That looks pretty clean, so I'll just drink what I can. <laughs> so if you came to me with alcohol, I'd be like, no, I've done any attempt me whatsoever. I've drank out of toilet water, and I will never do that again. <laughs> if you were like, Hey, you want this Mustang? Yes, I do. That's, uh, I, I love Mustangs. Ford Mustang. Or do you want a Almond Joy? No, I don't know who eats Almond Joys. <laughs> well, okay, look, I'm sure other people enjoy it because they still sell them, but I, I, always, I always hearken that back to my grandparents, so it's like an old people candy. Oh. <laughs> Probably not. You can, you can beat me up later. But if you came in with a watch him call it, oh, oh man, I'd probably do some terrible things for that. Oh, that's so good. I can even think about it. The crispy, crunchy peanut. Mm -mm. But enduring temptation can be difficult depending on what it is, right? The devil doesn't come with almond joys to me, it comes with a watch him call it. 
comes with a Mustang. He comes with, hey, look, it's time for you to get a new job. You have two jobs. That one is significantly more money than that one. You'll be happier with the one with less money. You'll be happier. I'm like, yeah, the one with more money, then what can I do with that? You know, I could do all kinds of good things for God's kingdom. I could, you know, pay off debt. I could donate to the church. I could help the homeless. I could buy a Mustang. That's, that's what I would do. He's like, well, I gave a little bit to the homeless, and uh, let's go put a down payment on that new Mustang. And that's like, I worked hard for my money, and I'm going to do what I want with it. That's what I would do. God's purpose in that was go, man, you should probably take the one that's lesser. You can't manage money. And maybe that job makes more time for ministry, for serving people. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I want to be approved. I hope you do too. I hope in these trials, that's what you think about. And when the temptation is so terribly difficult, reach out to somebody. We're brothers and sisters. We're to bear each other's burdens. We're to battle for each other. You know, and we all have friends and family, you know, that are in various stages of, well, okay, from, no, from family that has no idea who Christ is and doesn't care about that to, Maybe the holiest the holy person you know in your life. And there's that spectrum, right? And everything in between. If you're enduring a trial and you need someone's help, try to find someone who's more mature than you. you know, having prayer from someone is, is great, but it's always good to have like a, a mature older brother or sister that can help. Because what do they have? Wisdom. Right? They have ways to go like, hey, look, I've gone through that. Here's what I did. Maybe it won't work. And don't be like one of those people that go, no, nothing's going to work. I need your help, but nothing's going to work. So and you're like, well, try that. No, no, try this. No, no, I tried that. It doesn't work. Right? Don't be those people. Right? Go to them in earnest prayer and say, look, I need help. You know, what, what should I do here? But we also should be that for someone else. Right? There's this discipleship process. Everyone should have a Paul and everyone should have a Timothy. You should have someone above you that's disciple. It's there for you. And we should have someone below us that we're bringing up as well. Look for those people. God, if you ask for it, God will bring them along. And it may not be some formal discipleship process. It might just be somebody at work you're just you know, trying to pour into. And there's someone trying to pour into you. And then actually, if you think about the process, then they tell you you should have a Barnabas off to the side, somebody who annoys you really badly, and really tests your patience and tests your endurance in trials. But we get a crown for enduring those things. Not a worldly crown. God's not going to send us 7,000 whatchamacallits. We're building up treasures in heaven. That's the purpose. He says he'll give us a crown. 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives excuse me, birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, what? Brings forth death. So God doesn't send us temptations. That's the enemy's job. God allows trials. God puts us in them. And the enemy comes to tempt that we might shortcut what God's doing in that trial and give in to it, which will just cause us to sin, and that it'll cause shame and hurt and pain the enemy will accuse us and tell us we're terrible and tell God we're terrible and then we're stuck in this never-ending cycle. And it's a difficult one to get out of, but it is not God. God is, you know, you hear people like, oh, God sent me that person in my life to tempt me. No, God did not. No, God did not send you that man who has 14 girlfriends and wants to be only with you, right? Or, no, God did not send the new lady at work that wears more skimpy clothes to tempt you. The enemy uses people, for sure. God did not do that. It's, don't blame God for your own desires, which is basically what he says here, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. Sometimes. So you already have that in you. Right? This, this, this propensity to sin and desire. And desire doesn't have to be just sexual, right? It can be anything. It's 
just common, commonly, especially in today's world, a, a sexual desire, but it could be a desire for fortune, for fame, for sex, for, for anything. Everybody's a little different, but it says, because each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth, brings forth death. You know, people will say, like, oh, I really wasn't paying attention, just that came along and I just gave in and didn't even know. Or it was a minor indiscretion. No, it was not. Stop lying to ourselves. Before we actually act on sin, we've decided in here way before. We make provision for it. Well, if this circumstance happens and this circumstance happens, it must be God lining it up. So if that occurs and it doesn't, probably not sin. It's probably okay. It's what God did, right? It's what God sent along. Oh, no. No, man. We, we make way. We listen to the devil's lies. We allow him into our life. We entertain what he's saying. We go, well, you know, there's some truth to that. Right? Because that's the enemy's tactic. We, we saw it with the Lord in Matthew. When he goes out into the desert to battle with him, what does he come with? The devil comes with the scripture. He just only comes with half of it. He doesn't apply all of it. So the enemy knows scripture. He knows it better than you and me. He knows what it is. The only thing he didn't know was how the whole thing was going to end. Otherwise, he would not let Jesus get hung on a cross. But he tried to tempt him. Right? He tried to take him away. This, this is a... It's kind of a... I didn't make notes on this, and it's kind of a rant, but hopefully it's important. A lot of times they'll say, it's, they call it the temptation of Christ, or that when he was led into the desert to be tempted. There's a difference between you and me and the Lord. The Lord being out in the desert was never tempted to give in to sin. In him is not the same thing we have. We were sons of Adam, we were born in sin, we have this propensity and desire to do things that are against God. Jesus wasn't born with that. The Lord was tempted by the devil, right? So the devil comes along and he says, well, do this. If you're hungry, go, go eat this, or go throw yourself off of that. I don't believe for a second, and anywhere in Scripture, that he was tempted to actually give in to the devil, where he thought in his head, maybe I should. So when people will say, there's a song we sing, um, it's the one where Ken changes the lyrics. It's, uh, it says that he was tempted and uh, tempted and tried. Can't think of the song now. But our pastor changed the lyrics to tested and tried. Because it gives the impression that the Lord was somehow temp tempted to do things. The devil came and tried to offer that. But the Lord was never going to go, hey, I should take that. Do you, do you get what I mean? Does it, does it make sense? That we have a tempter who comes along and lures stuff in front of us. <coughs> and I'll think about it and go, oh man, I wonder if I can get away with that. Or I wonder if that will really be what it's what it is, right? I'm I'm allowing the temptation to set in and I might be tempted to say yes to it. The Lord's not like that. It says here, right? It said he God can't be tempted by evil. So he was never tempted by anything. And so there's this movie, The Last Temptation of Christ. It was out in like the eighties, and it talks about you know he was tempted to have he might have had a wife, and he wanted to have sex with Mary Magdalene. Like none of those things are scripturally true. They are lies from hell. The Lord is our model. He's never been tempted by evil to give in to evil. It may come along as that, but this is this is why we're different. This is why James is instructing us because as we make provision for sin, as we go, oh you know what, it probably would feel really good to eat that candy bar and blow my diet. Or I'm traveling uh, halfway across the country. I could go into a strip club. No one knows me. I could do it. I'll probably get away with it. The Lord will never let you get away with it. It's not him. But when you start doing that, you started making a provision for something. So I hope if there's a place in life where you've been thinking about something or giving in to something, someone's been messaging you, right, and you're starting to think, well, maybe it'll be different this time. Maybe God sent this. Just think about what it says, that once you have those desires and they're conceived, meaning you start doing something, 
It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Sin will never bring life, no matter what the enemy tells you. It will never be. Do not be deceived, 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. Well, God made me this way. Isn't that one pretty common nowadays? I was born this way. You know what? It's actually a scientific biological fact. You, you couldn't possibly know you were born that way. You are built with chemicals in your body that make you forget the first two to three years of your life. Think of that. I mean, do you remember anything from like two or three year old? You remember everything as it was. You remember what you were feeling? Most people can remember a memory or two. And sometimes that's actually just because you've been told it so many times that it becomes real in your head. You couldn't possibly know how you were born by biology. And that really, to me, that's what God's doing. Because it's a rough life as a baby. Maybe he's crying, you know, like the mom doesn't pick the baby up or doesn't get held. It starts to produce this disconnect. We struggle this with our adopted daughter, right? You, you bounce around. You don't have a mother that picks you up regularly or when your baby's crying and needs something and it doesn't go to it, it learns to either die or somehow survive without that. Most of what you give your baby by picking it up and holding it, right? You keep it closed. Moms, sometimes you, you skin to skin contact. It produces chemicals that grow this bond. You, it's, it's impossible to know how you were born. What it is possible to know is, is the trauma and the things that have happened through life, how they've affected you, right? And, and you know, Again, today's culture of psychology and things like that, you, you find people saying, there's nothing wrong with you, don't worry. You're fine. But no, you're not. No, you're not fine. You're, you're concerned and going to get help because you know this is not working for you. But then you're just told you're fine, so you go off and you live that way. And then you live in turmoil. Now, my heart breaks for people stuck in gender dysphoria, right? Or I'm going to just change what I am. That's not going to happen. It's not going to fix it. The suicide rate is twice as high after people do sexual changes. But then they go, oh, now I regret that. And now you have the government and schools protecting kids from their parents who know best for their child. You couldn't possibly know how you were born. It's a dumb argument, and it is nullified by science. So what is God saying, though, he made you as a kind of first fruit. He created you. He had a purpose for you. He loves you. He's not even, it's not, if you always like, he's not mad at you. God's not sitting there mad. I mean, we're parents. We're mad. I'm mad at my kid. I'm mad at my kid because of a dumb decision she makes. She's going to hurt herself. And then really what I decide is I'm not really mad. I'm terrified. She's going to destroy her life, and I can't save her, and I can't stop it. And then I go, God, what was the point in doing all of that? Why adopt her? Why have her? Why do all of these things? I impart all of that and none of it works. It was not God's plan for us to be this way. It was God's plan for us to be his first fruits. To fellowship with him. Much like it was way back in the garden before the fall of man. That's what he wanted for us. He's not mad. He's not irritated. He wants to restore you. He wants us to be in good fellowship with him. He sent his son to die that we might have life. Don't believe the enemy's lies, that you're broken and messed up and beyond forgiveness, or this is the last time God's going to allow you to go through this. He's not going to love me after this one. Of his own will, he brought us forth. That is God's decision. You cannot change that truth. No matter what lies you believe. And 19, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man <clears throat> excuse me, be swift to hear. Husbands, listen up close. Because your wives are listening. Slow to hear, like swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. 
And this just doesn't apply to wives. Wives have this all perfect. It applies to husbands only. Men. So correct me. Just kidding. It applies to all of us. Actually, I'd, I'd be willing to wager most women, their mouth opens quicker than ours. Because they're very vocal about struggles and stuff. We are to be swift to hear. We hear what people are saying. That's the first thing we should go to. What is this person really saying? Have you ever heard that um, that phrase, like when you're arguing with somebody, someone's just loading their shotgun? It's like, you know, you're arguing and you're telling your point, and they're not really listening to you. They're loading their shotgun to unload it on you as soon as you stop talking and to tell you everything you just did was said and said was wrong. I mean, that's what James is getting at. Be swift to hear. Listen to them. Be slow to speak back. <clears throat> don't be quick to start talking. And I, again, don't, don't, don't think I somehow have this one perfected. I, I do not. But it will also be slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I remember when I first became a Christian, I started reading through these things. And then using it. Well, the Bible says you should be slow to... Let me, let me go look it up real quick, and I'll read it to you. Swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to write. Just like, yeah, whatever. What would that mean? I don't know, but you should probably abide by that. That's part of our problem today. Is, you know, uh, the culture will say that. We don't listen enough. I mean, look, there's a point where you're going to come with me something so stupid that I'm going to probably not listen. Like, if I change my... I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl. I'm a girl in a boy's body. I'm going to wear a dress. I'm going to go and do all that. You're like, okay, no, that's just stupid. What I hear you saying is, you are totally confused and lost in the world. And you are just swept away by culture. That's what I hear. And, you know, we try to produce those conversations, and they don't want to hear that because they think what... They've already given birth to sin, right? They've already... It's already been conceived. They have this whole plan. This is what they're going to do. It's trying to talk a friend out of doing something dumb. You know what? I've been I've been uh, I've been praying on this. The uh, my marriage is, is in trouble, and the, the lady that God sent me at work, you know, she's the one. I'm gonna I'm gonna go meet with her this weekend. But dude, that is dumb. Do not do that. That is a total lie. God did not send you that woman. You have a woman. You have a wife. And that's it. That's one. That was it. That's all the one He gave you. It doesn't mean that life works out perfectly for us and that divorce isn't a reality. But a guy who's married should be at home with his wife not thinking about the woman at work. Now, he's been thinking about it so long that he's convinced himself God is allowing this. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Because wrath, I mean, getting mad, and look, I'm guilty of this too, right? Yelling because everything's out of control, that's wrath. It's not going to produce righteousness. It's not going to change things. It might temporarily find you obedience. But I don't want my kids just to, just to obey me. I want them to understand why I've taught them what I've taught them. That they might obey in that, but understand the loving place that it's coming from. But when I yell and scream, I just lose them. In 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What's the difference between meekness and weakness? They sound really similar, and the world uses them like they're the same. Absolutely different. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. Weakness is having no power. Right? The man who beats his wife, he beats her because she's weaker than him. She's built completely different. And he's a piece of crap for doing it. It doesn't because he feels stronger. Meekness would be a husband who doesn't do all those things, even if he could do it, because he's in control of himself. So think about it like a horse. Wild horses, Joel makes me think of, you, you brought this example up now when we were talking about horses earlier. <laughs> A wild horse is completely out of control. You cannot just get on one of those things and ride it. It's impossible. They don't know what it's like to even be ridden. They haven't been broken. 
So when you get a horse, you have this whole long process, and then it, there's, you all probably know better than me about it, right? But there's this process of breaking it. One is just getting a lead on it, right? And being able to move it around without slinging you all over in the ramp. Because it doesn't want to be controlled, and it's strong, right? We measure car engines by horsepower. The new Mustang, 440 horse. <laughs> Just talking about Mustangs and cars. It's kind of kind of all fit back around. God must want me to have a Mustang. Um, but it takes time, right? And the horse has to trust you. But what you actually end up having to do is break a horse's will, not its spirit. You break a horse's spirit, it's useless. You might as well put it down. You want to break its will, that it will listen to what you're doing. It'll be under control. But it is no less powerful. As a matter of fact, I think it actually becomes more powerful because it can control itself. That's what God is talking about when he calls us to be meek. I could punch that guy straight in the face, but I should not. I should not do that. One, it'll just cause me to sin. Two, it'll cause more problems. Three, what is it going to prove? Well, I'm a Christian? Well, it's probably not going to prove that because they're going to come back with, we're well, not supposed to be brawlers. That's what the Bible says. It's your Bible says. Right? You go, I'm going to walk away from this situation. I don't even have to tell them I'm going to walk away. I don't even have to pretend I'm tough. I just go, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to walk away. That's meekness. He says to be meek. Not any less strong, not any, but more in control. That's what God does with us, right? He fills us with our, his spirit because we have nothing from the world. Then he breaks our will. And then we become in control by the Lord and be used by the Lord. And he says to do that with the meekest, with the implanted word that we've been given. This thing. As we read it, we become implanted with it. It changes us. And he says in 22, but what? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I'm a good Christian. What do you do? Oh, I go to church on Sundays. Read my Bible three times a week. Do you do anything? This is going to be a... A, a long subject for James. But works is a reality for the Christian. We are to be doers. What he says in here, we're to do something with it. Not be hearers only. Deceiving ourselves into thinking we're something more than we are. I mean, I know I kind of added that part at the end. That's what he's getting to. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not for a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Do you forget what you look like sometimes? I mean, you look in the mirror in the morning, and you're like, oh, man, look at that face. You need to grow a longer beard, get a better fall hawk. My eyes are getting baggy, I'm clearly getting tired. You know, and then you... <laughs> stupid example. You know, you, you leave, right? You go to the store, and there's a lady at the counter, and she's like, hi! She smiles at you, and you're like, oh, huh. I wonder if she gets so cute. Maybe. Huh. I forgot what I looked like. I remember, I looked like I'm the same person, and I just walked out of the house and walked to the store. Right? But you forget what you look like. I must be pretty good looking. She liked me. She was just being nice. You forget what you look like. As we said, it's a natural man. That's what he does. He looks in the mirror and he walks away and then he forgets. And he goes back again and he goes, ah, oh, that's who I am. Then he goes back out of the world and forgets again. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, the law of freedom, is what we're on. There's the law, right? The Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments, the whole initial first part of the Bible, that law is not meant to save us. It can't. There's no saving in the law. What it does is it points out how messed up we actually are. Right? I mean, people say we've enacted a new law to save your life. Not really. Because a law is just a bunch of words. It's the action taken upon the law that might save the life, right? So the new law is, um, it's no longer 80, because it's 80 on Broadway, right? Yeah, if I messed that up. <laughs> You know, uh, it's no longer, what is it, 50, I think, in spots, right? So uh, to save lives, we're going to make it 40. 
Are you doing 40? Because I'm still doing 50 or 80. Right? I didn't, it's not saving my life because I have to do something with it. Right? The law points out in the Bible our guilt. It's grace that saves us. Christ's sacrifice that changes us. So the perfect law of liberty, the freedom that Christ came and brought, that's how we live. But he says to look into it and continue it. Don't just use it for your own personal gain. Continue in what God calls. And don't be a forgetful hearer of it, but also a doer of it. How many people are called to serve in the church? Say, uh, I don't know how many people are here, because we did math last week and it really worked out poorly. Let's say there's 40 people in here. How many people are called to serve in the church out of the 40? 40. Do all 40 of you serve? You should. We all should, right? We all are called to serve. We're called to do something. You know, we might not be able to, right? There are seasons in life where we can't do some of the things that we might. Right? We're raising kids, we have a family. That, that is our first priority. It's our first ministry. That's okay. But we're to be doers of it. And raising kids, moms, man, it's the toughest job in the world. And you, and you have to fight with the world now. And you're fighting for your kids. Why can't the world just do what it's supposed to so you don't have to fight for that and you can fight for other things? So you're being a doer. Don't get me wrong. But we are to be, as Christians, doers of this. We don't just walk around with our, you know, our cross on and be like, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian, by the way. I'm a Christian. See? We should do something with those things. Help others. Serve others. Serving. If you are stuck in, like, my life is terrible and it stinks, go serve. Because trust me, you'll realize quickly your life isn't as bad as you might think. In 26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. I don't, I, I hate the word religion. And part of that is my own life experience. I, what I saw for religion, when I grew up in a Catholic family. I didn't see doers. Other than people that went to church, and I went, and I'm like, what is that guy even saying? The music is terrible. The bread tastes weird. Why is he putting it in my mouth? And you're telling me that that's truly the blood of Christ? I mean, we all know there's no magic in the world. That's not how these things work. And people keep going to do this, and then they go home and beat their kids. Or they go home and get wasted. Or they go out to strip clubs. They cheat on their wives. <clears throat> That's what religion means to me. Doing stuff out of ritualistic behaviors because it's what a man said to do. It's not what James is going to define religion as. But a person who thinks they're religious, because people, you get this, right? I'm sure you get this. Like, you talk about something, you say you went to church, and they're like, oh, yeah, you're a religious person? I'm like, no, no, I am not. <coughs> I am not. I even believe the Lord Jesus hated religion. Not the way James defined this. But that's what we have to think about, right? The world says I'm a religious person. I'm like, no, not really. I mean, I have a relationship with Christ. My life was a wreck and he saved it. And I spend my time trying to help others do that. People go, oh, man, wow, that's a, man, not really what I was expecting. I thought maybe he just went to church, you know. Orrington, Calvary Chapel as a, as a whole, and especially Orrington, we often get the bearded cult. I hear that all the time. It's the stupidest thing. What? Why are we going to go? I mean, who goes to church three times a week? I, me, who's messed up and won't survive without it, actually? I mean, let's just be realistic. And plus, I like singing. I like doing worship. I like hearing the word and being challenged by it. I like serving at church. It's the, man, my life would be nothing without but I don't go because of ritualistic, I'm told to go. Right? Cults have often have a leader that tell people what to do. And they twist scripture. And there's, we can talk about cults someday. Right? You'd probably be surprised that I might classify some things that are not popular as cults. But If we're going to be religious people, we have to be doers. We have to take action on what Christ has given us. That's what he's going to start to say. What's the first one? Bridle the tongue. Cool horse example. 
bridle in his mouth. What is this? You ever seen when a horse does it, like moves his tongue around and all? So it gets annoyed by it, right? And it's stuck in his mouth. There's nothing it can do. It doesn't have hands where it's like, can you remove that, please? That's how he's calling us to be. To hold our tongues. Because it's a, a terrible weapon. Or the greatest of gifts, if you build the people up. Does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart. Ending in verse 26, this is what one's religion is useless. 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Who made it? So, James says, pure religion by God's standard visiting of orphans and widows. Why? The two most unprotected class of people in general. The widow has lost her husband who protects her and cares for her. The orphan has no parent to care for them. Often taken advantage of on both ends. Matter of fact, my um, my family my, uh, I'm a, my dad was one of Five, yeah, five. Let's not stop and let go through them all. Um, I grew up in Bangor, but spent a lot of time in Herman. My uh, my family, uh, well, my grandmother lost her husband. My grandfather, he died uh, when my dad was like five. He had died of bone cancer. A real, real horrible death. But she's now got five kids and needs someone to help care for her. And um, my step-grandfather met her and loved her and took in her kids. I wish it was a happy ending. You know, there's a lot to that story, and uh, there's a lot of things I would like to share that I cannot, because there are people alive still affected by this life that um, you know might not want to acknowledge the things. But Hurting orphans and widows is something God takes very particularly and very personally. I, I would say it like this, the scripture is kind of clear, there's a special place in hell for people to do those things. And uh, God sees that, as he says it through James, as pure religion, protecting others who cannot protect themselves. I have, uh, I have long wanted to say it, and there'll be a time where I will say it, and I will say it loudly. You know, you, you all have these things in life where people have a different picture of, of someone or a situation, right, that happens, and you're like, I wish I could just tell the truth. I wish I could tell you the truth so you understood. Protect orphans and widows. That's pure religion, right? Serving them, helping them. And then he says, what else? To remain unspotted from the world. How do we do that? Come to church three times a week. Join a cult. You know, you can do that. It's cool, too. Don't. Do not drink the Kool-Aid. <coughs> um, you know, yes, but still, going to church multiple times a week, it's not a bad thing. Right? It's come wash the world off of you here. Because our job as leaders is to wash you in the Word. And then God to pour out His Spirit. Right? And that's the sign of a big old healthy church. Right? God's spirit being poured out on it. It's growing. People are being changed. They want to be there. They want to fellowship. They want to do these things. It's a great thing. They're serving. They're getting connected in. They're meeting new people. They're pouring into their lives. And their, their lives are getting poured into. I mean, we didn't... We attended Orrington forever, right? I mean, there's, there's a of people there. And we didn't even fellowship with a third of the church until we adopted Maddie. Like a whole new group of people came along and there was like, well, we never fellowship with them in the days we didn't have kids. Didn't have really anything in common. Then all of a sudden you have this whole new group of people who are like, oh, I saw you walk in with a little girl. What's what's going on? You know, and then they you know, come over to our house, fellowship with us, and they want to pour into you, and then you do the same to others. You pour into them. Pure, undefiled religion. If we want to be religious people, according to the scripture, which isn't a bad thing, that God has a purpose for those things, and that's what our goal is to be. You know, remaining. Oh, went over. I 
still hear kids having fun. I bet Frank's probably dead. <laughs> He's probably like laying on the floor, totally passed out, and they're just running wild. I don't think that's the case. He was very excited to be with the kids. Manny will be back next week. He will continue to be here for October. He was, uh, he, uh, pray for Manny. Um, he has a, uh, some friends that are Mormons that have been interested in coming to church. He tried to get them to come out here because he thought maybe I'd be a little less brash than Pastor Ken. Um, but when he talked to them, they were actually excited to, to go to Orrington. So maybe they might see the truth. Cults, Mormons of cults, by the way. They're not Christians. They, they're just whole. They've seen ads on TV. They're like, we're Christians just like you. No, nope, you are not. Let's not, you know, uh, I don't know. Can you guys listen to Glenn Beck? He's a Mormon. He doesn't say that, though. I, I like him, but he's a, he's like a doomsdayer. Like, I just get too depressed listening to him. He's just constant. I'm like, Man, I gotta listen to something else. Like, I really hate the world right now. I'm just ready to go burn it all down. You know, turn it on, listen to some, some good talk. I, I, I listened to him for many, many years, but I always found that funny. Like he says he's immoral. Oh, he says he's a Christian. We're Christians. We're all Christians. We are not the same. Just be clear. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, I ramble, I'm sure. You, you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, that you would, uh, you would take all that we've read. There's so much in this first chapter. I really, if I slowed down, Lord, we could spend weeks just breaking that apart. And we'd be challenged by the, by the things that James had for us. A non-believer who had a direct experience with his half-brother, who he calls the Lord, not his brother. Even though he is our great brother. But it changed, changed James in such a way that he was called to write to the 12 tribes and the Christians all scattered about them, how to live life. There's so much in lessons in this book as we continue on in it that we should take out into our practical living as a Christian. How to battle sin. How to count joy in trials. How to be doers of the word. How to be pure religious people according to the scripture, not according to what the world measures religion by. I pray bless everyone in here. Looking out, it's a great privilege and honor to see faces. Not because it's uh, something I've done, Lord, because it's what, it's what you have done. The call in our lives from Scripture is to, uh, to protect orphans, widows, to keep us unspotted from the world, to walk one foot in the world and one foot in eternity, that we would uh, not be of the world, we would just be in it for the time. Until you come back, Lord, thank you. And, uh, Lord willing, we'd have uh, another week and a Sunday, and we would dig into your scripture. But if you choose to return in the meantime, I don't think anyone will complain. Thank you so much for everything. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name.